Hey, aloha, and how you doing? I am obviously not the tech czar. Gordo's on break, so um, I'll be hosting today, Andrew Lang, the security guy. Uh, thanks for joining us today on Hibachi Talk. I've got a great guest for you. Sam Sneed is here with us. Aloha, Sam. Thanks for coming out today. Um, she's from the uh, law firm of um, ESNA, and uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about an event that they put on this week that was amazing. Uh, we're gonna kind of give you a recap, so you know, if you didn't get to the event, um, sorry for you, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try to take care of you here as best we can and give you a little teaser and uh, try to influence them to put on some more of those. Uh, let's see what else. So Gordo's uh, headed down to UH to watch, uh, watch the Bulls play or the Warriors play next weekend, and uh, we may have a report next Friday from there, so check that out. Um, Sam, so let's see. Let's get to it. What, uh, what we like to do typically is start off uh, giving us a little background. You know, where'd you grow up? Uh, let's start there. You, where'd, you, where'd, you, where'd you grow up? All right, I was born and raised here. So, um, Oahu? My, or? Yep, okay. on Oahu. So my family's originally from Wailua side. So I grew up in Mililani. Uh, went through public schools. Go Trojans. All right. <laughs> and then I went away to school for college and business school in Denver. And then I came ah. back home for law school. Wow, I was just in Denver. That's cool. And where'd you go to school up there? Uh, University of Denver. Okay, nice. Beautiful up there. It's great, great state. Yeah. And did you did you stay? Did you do your law degree there as well? Because you you got quite a bit of education. So I actually came home to do the law degree. Okay. So I knew I wanted to come back home to live and work and you know contribute to the community, plug in. So I came home and went to Richardson. And so your background, you you worked. Uh, I forget, was t- give me a little bit about your background because it had some construction, you had a lot of different things in there. Yeah, so I got my, um, my background's actually in electrical engineering. Right, right, um, I mean, that's what it was. So I focused a lot on renewable energy when I was studying um, my senior design project, my group, we actually did um, sort of like a virtual model of our school and so we plugged in the um, data on the energy usage of the school and we did we did a payback calculator based on what the likely profile of wind and solar generation would be wow. in that area. It's really cool simulation. Um, and then while I was in school, I also interned briefly with Department of Energy. So they sent me out to Folsom, California. Um, I got to work in the SCADA department. Um, okay. so, so you've seen control systems yeah, and the whole nine Yeah, really, oh, okay. really great experience. Um, they did stick me underground behind glass doors, so that was also interesting. Mm. <laughs> interesting to see, you know, how our critical infrastructure is kind of set up and sure. what it looks like to live there. Wow. And so from the EE, what, um, how'd, you, how'd you move over into law? Or was it just... Um... So it was kind of, um, it's kind of an interesting progression. What I tell everyone is um, I went into engineering thinking that I was going to build robots and wind turbines and renewable energy systems. Okay. And I realized pretty quickly that, you know, you only get to build stuff that you can afford to build. So. <laughs> <laughs> you have to go help like General Dynamics do it or Boeing yeah, or whoever. Yeah, some, right? somebody needs to pay for your cool toys. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I went to business school. Um, also really interesting, completely different point of view, very macro view, you know, a lot of synthesis of completely different areas, not so technical. Um, but going through business school, I realized then that, you know, you can do whatever you want under the sun, but you also don't want to go to jail. So I went to law school. Wow. Okay. <laughs> interesting. So it, really what I try to do or what I enjoy doing is learning about new technology and figuring out how to make sure that it makes it to market, makes it to the people who need it and can use it. Okay. And then help them. And so there's, I guess around that, it says new products or intellectual property. There's like patent laws or, or right. whatever that maybe pertain to, do you help people bring stuff to market here from Hawaii as well? Or So we have to, we are working with um, a couple of clients who do, um, Actually, my particular area of interest is how it works in with the government contracting. Okay. Um, so I'm awesome. really interested in dual use patents and that sort of intellectual property where it's basically the government has an interest in funding and supporting a certain type of research or idea. And so they give people the tools and the, um, the economic support to do it. And then they let you take some portion of the usage to commercialize and do what you will. And the government will you keep its... Um, designated purpose. Wow, yeah, I know DARPA puts out a list of technologies that they would like developed every year. They do. It's like I've seen it. So do, is there grant money associated with that then or, or do they just provide like expertise or is it mixed up? A little bit of both. Okay. Um, so it depends on the program that you go through. For example, um, the SBIR grant pro- 
program is really great. Um, lots of times the procuring agencies will be um, DOD entities. Um, they'll fund really high tech research, really, really interesting work that comes out of there. And at the end of it, um, the DOD or the procuring agency, again, they, they take what the government interest is and they'll say, um, you can choose to own it if you want, and we'll keep a license to use what we want to use, and then you can have the rest of it. Or so go to market. Right. Or if you don't want to own mm. it, we'll, we'll take the ownership rights if you really don't want it, and you know, we'll patent it to make sure that the information gets out there in the world. Wow, interesting. So is that, do you have to engage them from a, I, mean, I guess there's a, a legal engagement when you take that on, the obligation, I guess, and yeah. like that's so interesting. Like if you if they started giving you money or wanting you to develop something, I guess you have to develop it, right? There's, there's Definitely. A <laughs> so federal government money is great money, but it does come with strings, so sometimes it does help to have somebody who can explain to you where the strings are and what they mean. Interesting, interesting. So and is this um, primarily, is stuff, is it going on at UH? Is it going on at a lot of the universities here? Or is it going on public sector or, or all the above? Surprisingly, all of the above. And I wow. think that's one of the things that people don't really know a lot about Hawaii. We have some really fascinating research that goes on here at the universities and on the private side. And it's really, I think we need to do a better job of marketing it and letting the world know just, you know, how innovative we are here in Hawaii. Yeah. So a lot of that came out in the show that was called actually uh, Envision, Strategize and Actualize, um, you know, how technology can transform Hawaii, which was, uh, it drew me when we first, you know, first talked about it. And I was like, well, this is going to be a good one. And then we had this really cross-pollination of speakers, and we'll get to some of that, but when you, when you take that sort of vision and, and you know, widen the lens a little bit, because you go to a lot of shows that are sort of focused, mm -hmm. and I think that the, the, um, the ESNA show that you guys put on was amazing because it, it brought uh, that cross-pollination of, of, of ideas that you don't normally hear about, and we'll, we'll definitely get to some of that in the show a little bit. So um, uh, tell us a little bit about, so you've been in, you moved out of basically through EE and through business into law, and then did you begin practicing, uh, did you start where you are today or did you start at another firm or how, I don't know how that, does that, how do you transition into like working, the working attorney world, I guess. Right, so. After I, the school. Right, so while I was in school, I had actually planned on starting in the government or working in public policy. Um, and I, I realized, you know, after talking with a few advisors that it might be better to start off more on the, um, more in the, the real lawyer track, so to call it. Um, because you know you do need a lot of mentorship when you work in the law. It's it's almost like um, it's almost like being a doctor or being an apprentice, where okay. there is an apprenticeship period. Because the law in the past couple decades has just become so complex, where it's not it's no longer really feasible, except in a very few select areas, to just start practicing right out of school. Wow. Okay. So if you maybe you worked on that as your thesis item or something in school, so you learned it well. So I had actually, while I was in school, I studied quite a bit of um, intellectual property, government contracts, and then privacy and security law. Awesome, okay. And, and so it's interesting that there's a lot of, um, I think there's a lot of convergence now coming in the law where it's gotten complex enough and the world has gotten complex enough, honestly, that we need rules that will cross those boundaries. Yeah, privacy, security r runs right into cyber, yeah, which Absolutely. is the big thing which we, we talk about all the time. That's awesome. Well, let me do a. I uh, have. We have a couple of little things we do. One of them is um, you. You got. You know. Got. You know. Got one tech job. <laughs> That's what it's called. So let's uh, let's see what we got today. So this is how not to carpet your stairs, right? Oh, no. <laughs> how do you how do you get up and down? I mean, is that it's just mind boggling to see that just the photo. I think somebody. I forget where that that came in from, but um, there's better choices out there for your stairwell. You want to run across anything like that? I haven't. <laughs> uh, well. With the lawyer hat on, I can just think of all sorts of torts. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to, you know, make yourself a pest about it. Wow. <laughs> so we got a, a tweet up here. They wanted to know what does uh, ESNA stand for? So great question. ESNA, we've been around for maybe about a year and a half. It stands for Envision, Strategize, and Actualize. Okay, so that, so that was the name of the show. It's the name of the so show. So I thought ESNA were the names of the, the attorneys. Okay, gotcha. Gotcha. I thought you were the S. No, you no, know, not so, so much. I mean, okay. <laughs> I didn't pick that up. So amazing. So uh, Envision Strategize Actualize. We had, a, um, we had an opportunity. It was on Wednesday. Um, and um, I just want to, we had, I want to give you an idea of a mix of some of the folks over there. Donnie Dawson was there from the Hawaii Film Office. Uh, Kelly McCandless that was there running a, 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 one of the uh, panels. For, uh, she's a, a big uh, a privacy person from uh, Hawaiian Electric. Uh, Alan Oshima was there, Ian Kitajima was there from Oceanit, who does a lot of R&D, nanotechnology. Um, and we also had educators like um, um, Steve, um, 
uh, where's Steve? Steve Arbach. Steve Arbach was PCAT, there. Yeah, yeah, from PCAT was there. So we had, it, it was an amazing conversation uh, and we will get to, um, well, let's, let's talk about, let's talk about what you first, in, you know, how did it get started as an idea? So when you, you know, first of all, we need to, we need to educate, we need to put on a show. So what, what did you, how did that come about? Right, so um, in my firm, I, in the past, we've put on, or our group, we've put on similar, we call them thought leaders conferences. Okay. And the notion is to um, raise the average level of discussion of people who do have decision-making responsibilities. And so when we were thinking about this year's program, we realized that, you know, technology has evolved and become so pervasive, really, that you could be in any industry and you're going to have to have some sort of tech or IT skills. And so we started thinking about, okay, what are the resources out there? And we realized that there are, like you said earlier, there are phenomenal conferences that go really deep into particular subject areas, mm -hmm. particularly on the tech side. Um, and they have ones that are business themed, they have ones that are policy themed or education themed. And again, people go into the conferences, they get great depth of knowledge, and then they all go home and nobody ever comes back and talks to one another yeah. about it. And a lot, big problem that we saw, because um, it comes up a lot in our work and with um, the volunteer work we, that we do sometimes, is that these problems, they transcend industry, they transcend businesses, and they're really problems that everyone faces. It doesn't matter what you do, what you make, how you provide service. So they're very universal, and you know, we live in such a small, connected community mm -hmm. that yeah. I don't know how you couldn't have a universal or really a solution that's developed that involves everyone. Yeah, so, and, and that, that came up. We actually worked through from some, some deep, we had cyber, and we had, well, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the show after the break. The, um, the other thing I thought was, uh, was very interesting was the um, sort of the format, right? So a multi, a multiple panel format, right. which was really good because there was a, a mix and also led by, um, you know, the uh, moderators for each panel also was a contributor to the mm -hmm. discussion, which was kind of, and there was a lot of uh, Q&A, you know, with the audience as well, which in, I've done a lot of those in Hawaii where you don't always get good yeah. feedback from the audience or nobody so wants to ask People questions. Their and, hands. Yeah, it was, it, so that worked out really well. I mean, it was, uh, uh, how did you settle on uh, the venue? Because that was a great venue. I, I had looked at that for a show for HICTA. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't end up there, but uh, I, I enjoyed the venue. What so did you think? I, I really love the venue. Um, I think I had been um, at HPU after they had renovated and I walked by it and I saw it and, you know, I saw the floor to ceiling whiteboards and I went, this is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I want to be in this room. And, you know, that they did a fantastic job of overhauling their IT. It's everything's connected. You know, it's a perfect space for doing, I think what our conference is trying to do is spur all sorts of, you know, what you would think would be disparate thoughts and try to bring them together and, you know, put it out on the whiteboard, spit it all out and see how it matches up. Yeah. So if you don't, you know, if uh, HPU is one of our, uh, we love HPU. So um, this is where the show was. Uh, they do have stuff for rent down there. So you know, if, if you got a show or you got something you want to do, go check out their space. It might work out. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to pay some bills, as Gordo likes to say, and uh, we'll be right back. Aloha and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. I am Ina Chang. I am the guest host for Small Business Hawaii with Reg Baker. Tune in every Thursday at 2 p.m. and watch us. Aloha. I'm Jay Fidel, and I'm the host of Research in Manoa, Mondays from 12 to 1 on thinktechhawaii.com. Take a look at us and learn about uh, geophysics, learn about planetology, learn about the ocean and earth sciences at UH Manoa. You'll really enjoy it. So come around, we'll see you then. Aloha, my name is Danelia, D-A-N-E-L-I-A. -E and I'm the other half of the duo, John Newman. We are the co-hosts of Keys to Success, which is live on Think Tech live streaming network series, weekly on Thursdays at 11 a.m. Aloha. Aloha. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science here on thinktechhawaii.com. I hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. to discover what's likable about science. Hey, aloha, and welcome back to Bocce Talk. Um, here with Sam Snee, we're chit-chatting about a show. We want to keep you baited just a little bit, so let me do a security minute for you. Um, a report just came out from Kensington, which I got a hold of, um, talking about laptop theft and that uh, it's really much higher than people would expect. And that's also, you know, where this big loss of data tends to occur. So 
Um, 34 percent of organizations, what they found, don't don't have a physical security policy in place for their laptops. 54 percent of the respondents don't currently use physical locks for their IT equipment. 80 percent don't use locks on non-computing equipment like projectors, hard drives, or monitors. So. When, we, when we're talking about data loss, which we have here, we talk about cybersecurity and other ways we lose things, uh, laptop theft from in, you know, internal sources is still uh, one of the really large ways this is happening. I, I, I wouldn't have thought that myself, so I was kind of surprised. So lock down your devices, make sure you've got a good asset inventory, all that kind of stuff that we've talked about, because uh, it seems like laptops are still being stolen out there. So don't think yours are safe if you know, your company owns them. Um, so that's it for the security minute. So let's get back to ESNA, because we had a ball. So we had speakers ranging, and so we had Envision, Strategize, Actualize, How Technology Can Transform Hawaii, a show Wednesday. Sorry if you missed it, we'll give you a snippet of it here. Um, but uh, Donnie Dawson was there, one of the very first panelists, and she really, I was amazed at, you know, she's talking about drones and how drones are, people are using drones now, they're filming in Hawaii, they're not paying for the licensing that she's, her office right. is supposed to protect, right? So what, uh, I mean, what did that stir for you? Like, you know, wow, is our legislation not keeping up with technology at all? Or? Well, I thought it was such a perfect um, case study, really, of how, you know, again, why we wanted to, um, why we wanted to have this conference. And I'm glad you brought up the issue of laptop theft. Is that technology has become mobile? So that's a yeah. good and a bad thing. Sure. <laughs> um, and it's become basically democratized. It's become so ubiquitous. Everybody has a cell phone in their back pocket. Everybody has you know, some sort of mobile computing device that can store sensitive data. And the advantage of it being mobile is obvious, but I don't think people always think about the disadvantages. And so talking about the drones, you know, they're to the point where I can go over to Walmart and buy one for maybe like 50 bucks. And so it's a perfect example, I think, of how technology is so easily available. Mm -hmm. And people don't always consider, you know, what might be, not to be a downer, but what might be the risk factors associated with having these devices everywhere on all the time. Yeah, like the, especially with the drones, like you just didn't consider that, you know, wow, it, you know, filming in Hawaii costs money. You, mm -hmm. you have to pay Hawaii to film our beaches or our parks or our forests or whatever. But drone operators can just go up and they got, you know, high resolution cameras and GoPro black and they hook them up and next thing you know, they're taking that, they're like amateur movie makers. Right. And so they're, they're sort of thwarting the whole process. And so she was struggling with that, right? She had gone for right. advice from California and it's like, uh, good luck. Right. And I so think it was amazing to hear that. What we see on the law side is I, I think one of our other panelists, Ian Kichijima of Oceanit, mm -hmm. put it fantastically is that the need is never, the human need is never going to change. What changes is how we address it. Mm -hmm. And so the how portion on the tech side is pretty obvious. You can, again, go to Walmart, go to any store, you can buy some sort of tech solution. And so what we've been really struggling to keep up with is on the policy side, as far as, you know, what do we think are appropriate boundaries for how we do things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, what, you don't want to restrict people, right? but you can't just let them have all, you know, all the, there is intellectual property rights and there are things right. that are owned and so you can't just take them for your own use and, or at least you can't take them and make business out of them without, you know, remunerating the proper right. uh, persons or licensing in the, the technology or the information. And yeah, so Ian was great. So Ian Kitajima was another panelist and his panel ended up amazing. Those guys actually got into education and then they got into leadership and um, I think it was suggested that all the old guys like me with the bald heads and the gray hair got to get out of the way and let the kids, like, we should go work for them because they're, um, they have a different perspective on, on how they can help the world. And we need to quit telling them how. And we had a, a couple students in the audience. We and did. Sh their comments were sort of, I think, like, don't, don't put us in a pipeline. Don't, don't, don't keep us in a channel. Let us decide how to do what it is we need to do. And it was refreshing to hear I don't know if we're all ready to get out of the way yet. I mean, I want to get my paycheck, but, you know, maybe I don't need it. I don't know. I think there's room for it all, you know. I mean, and that's kind of going to be the struggle in the next couple decades is where we have the workforce that is aging and transitioning to the baby boomer generation, um, from the baby boomer generation to the millennial generation. And oftentimes very different work styles, very different, um, very different needs and uh, technological awareness or ability. Um, but again, going back to Ian's comment, it's, the human need is never going to change. It's always mm -hmm. how you do things that mm -hmm. does. And so, I so, do you think it's a trust element? I mean, you know, like a generational trust element kind of thing. Is it, you know, how like we the, the blue collar, the boomers have all these, and I'm I think I'm not 63, so I'm right at the end of them, or I think I'm in the boomers. But you know, we 
we have a, a, an expectation of, of the how. Right. And, and, I, and it's not shared, I don't think, and it's not necessarily the best how, you know, for sure. Right. And I think it's the expectation that there is a single how is what has changed yeah, sure. with, with <laughs> the millennial generation. Again, with with the proliferation of technology and what, you know, you can kind mm. of think of it as the democratization of information where if you look hard enough, you can probably find what you want to know somewhere mm -hmm. if you try hard enough. And so as a result of that, you know, people can self-teach, they can self-learn and they can become self-starters. And I think a lot of people in the millennial generation expect to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. But it's sort of, do, it's sort of, coming to the, the decision or coming up with a strategy is how do we how do we make marry that flexibility with some of the security and the time tested structures that already exist now the ones that we the ones that we believe or we know like uh, you're getting paid x so i expect you to work for your pay right. but i think there are organizations um, i don't know if it's google or amazon but they i think they give their staff like an hour or so many hours a week to go do something creative mm -hmm. like create something new and it's unstructured but they're you know so they're i don't know if they're accountable with a report of what they're doing or i'm not sure if, if the company owns it or they own it i'm not sure how that works but right. it seems like the right idea at least uh, from what the one uh one of the students expressed anyway about the way we um i guess the i guess she was really talking about her career path mm -hmm. sort of not being don't don't put me in a pipeline i think was the thought because i it may not be a pipeline at all right i, th I think it's sort of um learning to be comfortable with that spirit of innovation mm -hmm. and bringing it into our everyday lives that I think a lot of younger people want to be able to see in their workplace because, you know, it's interesting as time goes on, more and more studies are coming out that find a lot of parallels between the millennial generation and actually the greatest generation mm -hmm. where um, a lot of findings are that they share a lot of traits in that they want to be mission oriented. They want something that they mm. can believe in and work towards and, you know, really really fall behind and um so strong ethics then strong, so they, strong you know it's not ethics. we're not faking it you know right. it's legit yeah and help the community or help the world right. or right. truly uh, truly make a difference like like really make a difference right. not, not say we make a difference and not you know and i think a lot that's, of the, that's good a lot of the basic tools are available now it's just again we, we want to make sure we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. that we do have tried and true methods and structures and institutions that are valuable and that they are very inextricably linked with our community that you know we can't mm. we can't throw them out overnight it's yeah not I, I kind of wonder if there's a, pr a little bit of protectionism in there you know is there a little bit of fear um, of change which is I'm sure is normal you mm -hmm. know and, and how much change can we have because oh you know two you want to enable failure, right? Because if you're not failing, you're not trying, all those types of things. But too much failure can 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 cost you the business, right? right. So there's that that aspect of it. And I don't, I've never heard, I don't heard of millennials asking for that kind of, you know, lateral room in their job performance. But I think somehow we've got to tie their their performance to the greater good. You right. know, what's this company doing? What are, what, what, what are they doing to enable this company to contribute or something like that? I hear that, you know, discussed quite a bit. And it came out, you know, on the show. Absolutely. And I think, the way I, I've heard it expressed before that, you know, change is inevitable. It's sort of like when you, it's sort of like the tides. The mm -hmm. tide will always come in, the tide will always move, the waves will always come in. And so it's a matter of, do you dive deep and avoid getting swept out? Do you mm -hmm. learn how to catch the wave? Or do you just kind of stand where you are and hope it doesn't knock you over, <laughs> right? Yeah, I think uh, that's the tourist approach. <laughs> the uh, interesting, um, so we also had, um, you know, um, uh, is that Alan, Alan Oshima? Yes. For, was there from HECO, yes. the head of HECO. And wow, like he's enabling, he's talked about like the sharing of information that we're not even talking about the good things that are happening. He was talking about some education programs that they contributed to and it was difficult to get the contribution into the hands of the school because uh, it was like a, 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 I don't know if it was a grant or how, the way it was funded, mm -hmm. uh, that that was hard. You know, so there's um, but there's all these um, there's some amazing things going on in R and D here and in education here that you don't hear about. And right. So we heard about it at the show. I was like, wow, I never heard of this. Right. And there's you know there's so much room for collaboration. And I think culturally we're raised to believe that you work with your neighbor, you work with people who are here. It's just I, I don't know what happens in the translation between being raised with that mentality and then entering the workforce where we have this. 
I want to call it a bad habit almost of you hunker down at your job and you don't look outside. Ah. And which is unfortunate. Kind of buried behind the keyboard. Right, right. And you know, you don't you don't talk to people who are in different industries or sometimes even in different departments in the same in the same organization. And that's kind of what we wanted this conference to be the first step to work against. Because again, like you said, we have fantastic resources. We have fantastic minds here. Mm -hmm. And we're small enough that it's not that hard to work together. We just need to, I think, start talking. Yeah, and, and when we found out there was an educator there from uh, Hongwanji yeah, School. Yeah, the Hongwanji Mission um, Schools. And he kind of turned us all on our ears, like, hey, here's the stuff we're doing. He had built an IT organization for his students. They could use any device, any software. I mean, I was like, I want to go to school there. Right. I, I, I'd love to go to school there, you know. And he was, are they K to 12? I'm not sure. I don't know the school, but. I think the one he, the program he was talking about was K through 8, but we'd have to double K through 8. I, I mean, so, you know, amazing, yeah. to, amazing to give those kids that gift of, of anything's possible. Here's the toolbox. Build whatever you want. Absolutely. Wow. You know, I didn't get that. I got ABCs and yeah. multiplication tables. Sit and down and face the teacher, right? Stuff. <laughs> right, sure. Yeah, yeah. And I think a number of our speakers actually touched on that where, you know, you want to bring innovation into the classroom as early mm -hmm. as possible because we want our children to really internalize that, to understand that that's a part of life and that there are different ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. And we want to encourage that because it, it does spur valuable products out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need our, the leadership in our community definitely needs to step up and, and enable this. And we, we talked a little bit about that. Steve Auerbach was there from PCAT. Um, he had some great hypotheses about how things occur and why they occur. Um, and, you know, he's charged, I think, with um, delivering some educational components out right. there um, in a more of a boot camp style, I think. Or is it is actually, are, are they integrated with the UH a little bit or something, the co community colleges, I think, PCAT? Right. So PCAT is the um, Pacific Center for Advanced Technology Training. Um, they're a consortium of the community colleges under the UH system. Okay. So they do plug in with the UH strategic planning. Um, and they've been doing a lot of great work as far as um, having, boot, like you said, boot camp style trainings. And it's an interesting new approach to education where you do have sort of the seminar set up. And so it's, flex it's more flexible, I think, for people who might already be in the workforce mm -hmm. or students who want to be exposed early on to that sort of education. And it's not something that you see integrated just yet into a lot of curriculum, mm. but it's, you know, very focused hard set of hard skills that you can leave with pick up sure so we need to get like steve and now we need to get them in here on the show and we've ran yeah. through our time today amazingly it's awful quick i'm sorry for that thank you for coming out yeah thank you for having I me i owe you a cup we, we don't we never <laughs> let our guests go away empty-handed but i've got to get a solo cup i got to get it autographed by gordo and myself and i will deliver it to you <laughs> and um come back anytime next time maybe before the show so we can you know see the audience a little bit and get yeah. get, get them get them pumped up so um, thanks for watching us today. Appreciate it. And uh, we'll talk again soon. Aloha. and laddies. This is Angus McTech here on Think Tech Hawaii and on my favorite show, Hibachi Talk, with my good old buddies, Gordo the Tech Sara and Andrew the Security Guy. Please join us every Monday, no it's Friday, every Friday from 1 p.m. to 1.30 p.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii and you can also find us on YouTube, Hibachi Talk. Aloha!